We are so delighted that you stopped in today. Our desire is to provide you with scriptural teaching to bolster your personal walk with God. I trust you'll enjoy the selection. May you receive it with an open heart and a spirit of prayer. God bless you all. Luke chapter 1, and I'll begin ve reading in verse number 1. Excuse me. Hold your finger at Luke. I, almost, I made this mistake already twice tonight. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Aren't you glad I didn't read the first 13 verses of Luke and then turn around and had to read the first 13 verses of Acts? I've been 26 verses more than any of us could handle. No, I'm teasing. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed, or that word is really shewed, S-H-E-W-D, it's a slightly different from show. Show means to just to let something be seen. To shew means to uh, proclaim or to reveal something. To, to, uh, so there's, there's a close similarities there, but uh, uh, some small uh, individualities between those two words. You know, I was reading a... I, I was doing a Bible study the other day, and they had a verse in there that, that uh, the scripture said shewed, S-H-E-W-D, and that when they put it in the Bible study, they changed it to showed. And I, I think that is a crying shame. Leave the word alone. Everybody say amen. Who, to whom also he shewed or showed himself alive by his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since." That word baptized, remember it means to be submerged, inundated, to be totally dunked. Notice that the scripture used the word baptism both as applying to water baptism and spirit baptism. We need to stay dunked in the Holy Ghost. Amen. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See, they're still looking for a Messiah to deliver Israel. They have not yet understood that Jesus come to save not just Israel, but the world. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which, said, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so, shall, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven." 
Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. You know I live in Olivet now? Isn't that neat? I just like that. I live in a scriptural place. I live in the place where Jesus went to heaven or where he ascended into heaven. I'll let that be my claim to fame. And he returned into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey, which when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the brother of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. Yes, Jesus had half-brothers through his mother Mary. Praise God. Theodore Parker said this. He was a man that, that lived from 1810 to about 1860. Died a young man by today's standards, perhaps not for that day, 50 years of age. But he made a statement and wrote it down that says this, Men cannot live all to this world, if not religious. Man cannot live all to this world. If not religious, he will be superstitious. If he worship not the true God, he will have his idols. Man cannot live to himself only. My dad's got a statement, and I quoted, have quoted over time many of my dad's statements that I find unique to him. And I am very thankful for a godly parent and, and godly heritage. But my dad used to say something along this lines, man will find something to worship. He's going to find something to worship. There's an innate awareness within all of mankind of his insufficiency. The fact that he is not of his own self sufficient. Scripture tells us that we are complete in him being Christ Jesus. But man understands that he needs help. From a help meet, from a spouse to other means, and so man's life is oftentimes consumed with seeking for help in that thing or those things that he perceives that he needs. A variety of sources are encountered in man's affairs. Some people engage in what they think to be their help or source of anchor. And that they engage in what is called ancestral worship. Somehow in their minds they come to believe that the moment a loved one or a family member or some, uh, someone of their genealogical tree passes from this life into eternity, that they can entreat them and can seek their favor to operate and the spiritual realm in their behalf. Now I'm going to blow your mind and say I believe in ancestral worship. I only believe though in the ancestral worship that we have in Christ Jesus. When we are born again of the water and the spirit, we come heirs of, of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus and and to that I'll say yea to ancestral worship, but to any other form I will say please don't waste your time. You're making yourself vulnerable to spirits and demonic spirits that will, that will fool in, and take advantage of your superstition. There's other, another way that oftentimes you'll see man try to find that which is void or lacking in his life. He will engage in what is called idolatry. Idolatry is simply looking at some inanimate object and giving to it or accrediting to it a power or an ability to move or operate in your behalf. It could be something as silly as a lucky nickel, a favorite ring. Have, have y'all 
Now, I, I preached about televisions tonight, very, uh, this morning, very, very shortly. I'm not against televisions. I'm against the abuses of television. I'm against what we watch, which is not according to righteousness and godliness and holiness. Everybody say amen. Praise God. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I have watched in my channel surfing, which my wife absolutely hates, I can watch three shows at once. You know, triple your pleasure. Isn't that right, brother? Okay, I got a witness here. But I, I, I've surfed and seen these, these guys that play uh, Texas Hold'em. You ever seen those guys? They will have their little voodoo dolls. They will have their little special little ornament that they'll put on top of their cards that's supposed to empower their cards. It's merely idolatrous superstition looking for perhaps some guiding saint or virgin or even astrology. If you open the paper and read your astrological predictions, shame on you. And if you waste a dime to get some book that tells you how your day or your affair, your year is going to be, may the Lord bless you with Enlightenment. The true Christian. All, you know, some of these things are even used by true, uh, people that call themselves Christians. But the true Christian in his walk with God will, f- will boldly uh, uh, face these things in opposition. For a true Christian is one who directs his affair and models his life After the life of Christ, in fact, the definition of a Christian is a follower of or a mimicker of or one that inspires to be like Christ Jesus. You see, he is alive. And we need to know that Jesus is alive. The first of the book of Acts is a continuation of the book of Luke. The writer of the book of, of Luke, also Luke the physician, wrote later on a continuation of his book of Luke that we know, his second work that we know as the book of Acts. Luke was, as I mentioned, a physician. He was a doctor of medicine of his day. He was thought or known to be a convert of Paul in his missionary journeys and in his ministry. Luke was a Gentile. He uh, uh, is most thought to be uh, 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 one that uh, was from very early in the beginning of the New Testament church and the ministry. In fact, in Luke chapter 1, between verse 1 through 3, uh, he records saying that uh, he was even perhaps a first-hand witness to some of the things that Jesus went through and some of the life and the ministry of Jesus and how to bring all that to uh, clarity, uh, it, it makes a little bit of difficulty. Nevertheless, he states that his former work was to declare all that Christ had begun to do and to teach. Verse 2 in Luke chapter 1, until the day in which he was, or in Acts uh, 2, until the day that he was taken up, verse 3, to whom he showed himself or shewed himself alive after his passion, that would be his death, burial, and resurrection, by many infallible, that word infallible means undeniable, absolutely verifiable truth. I want this evening just for a little while, and I, and, I, and, and, and I don't know if this is going to be a Bible study or a sermon. I don't know. I just, I just, I just, I'm just here because I feel God wants me to be here, and I'm trying to do what I feel God wants me to do. But I want for the li- li- next little while tonight to just disclose what, Je- what Luke was, ta- uh, what, excuse me, what Luke was uh, disclosing and talking about when he mentioned the fact of many infallible truths because I want us to understand tonight that we are not basing our lives on some some 
hodgepodge, uh, concocted uh, ideology from the mind of one. We are not engaged in walking with the Lord because uh, it is something that somebody remotely long time ago contrived in their mind. There's a religion today, it's called Mormonism, if you like to know, that has at its, as its originator one man who saw, allegedly saw, some books from which he read, uses special glasses after hearing where to find these books from an uh, unknown angelic host called Moroni. But we don't walk after the hodgepodge ideology or concoction of one man because Luke said there are many infallible proofs of the things that I'm telling you. And so we begin to study the fact that Jesus is, the fact that he was is not necessarily such a challenge. Historically, we know he is. Historically, we find that he, that he was. However, when it comes to his death, burial, and resurrection, and most uh, uh, definitively his resurrection, it becomes a little more challenging because history does, want, does not or cannot disclose the things that it cannot understand. And so in the pages of history, you're going to find it difficult to, to find a proof of the, the resurrection Christ. But if you want to find the proof of the resurrected Christ, let's start first in the Bible. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 28 that Mary and uh, the other Mary and uh, the other Mary and the other Mary and, and Barnes, one of the uh, theologians of, of uh, days gone by, also suggest that with Mary, uh, uh, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, and uh, that there were also very possibly other women that accompanied. And he would suggest that Salome, the the wife of Zebedee, remember the two sons of Zebedee, uh, might have been a companion there. And Joanna, Joanna, the wife. Of, uh, of Cusa who is mentioned also in Luke chapter 8 it's most probably that these ladies got together on the first day of the morning and they, they went to anoint the body of Christ you see when Jesus was uh, crucified on the cross he was hurriedly wrapped in, in his grave clothing put in a borrowed tomb uh, uh, and, and there he was left because it was on the precipice of the Sabbath and they couldn't touch a dead body and they couldn't do the things that they needed to do so on the third day they, they went to prepare the body and make sure that the incense and all the preparation of the dead was made proper for the Lord Jesus Christ and so as they went when they arrived there the, the scripture says that somewhere in that morning that the and perhaps it was a moment of their arrival at the tomb that the earth shook there was an earthquake and then an angel of the Lord appeared before them and that that angel talked to those ladies and said that Jesus is not here that he has risen and so the ladies the Bible tells us turned and ran back to Jerusalem ran back to the apostles and the other disciples of the Lord to disclose what they had heard now we know that you get a lot of ladies together and and men too, in all fairness, stories can get exaggerated. So it's important that we not base our faith in the account of one. But if you go on to study, you'll find that the Bible tells us that there were soldiers that were there at the tomb. And that the Sanhedrin, having learned that Jesus said that you can uh, destroy this temple, but in three days I'll raise it up, understood the spiritual connotations of what Jesus was getting across. And so they sought the Lord Jesus. Uh, they sought, uh, if you will, Pilate and said, uh, we need to put some soldiers in front of that tomb unless the disciples come and steal the body away to perpetuate this myth that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And so... 
the Bible says that in his history, uh, Scripture tells us that those soldiers also became privy to the opening of the tomb and the angelic visitation. And in fright and in fear, they ran back to the Sanhedrin and disclosed the things that they saw. And when they arrived there, the, high, the chief priest, the high priest, looked at these soldiers and said, we've got to keep this thing quiet. We've got to keep this on the down low, the hush, hush. We want this Christian group to die. We want them to cease to exist. You can't tell anybody. And so the Sanhedrin, the high priest, the scripture tells us, paid these soldiers a a bribery and gave them a, a fee and said, now keep your mouth shut. Don't you be telling anybody. In verse 15 of the book of Matthew chapter 28, the scripture says that this thing, somebody opened the mouth, was widely known. In John chapter 20, the disciples are told of the resurrection. Peter and John, they run to the tomb of the Lord Jesus to see if the things that they are told is true. Scripture tells us that Peter, uh, excuse me, that John arrived first, outran Peter, and when he got there, he merely stuck his head through the door of that open tomb where the, the stone had been moved, and, and as he stuck his head in, Peter flashed by, having caught up with him, ran in. They, they both beheld there in that tomb that would have been loaned, uh, if you will, the, the, the gray clothing of Jesus, separated the head cloth at one side and, and the rest of it on the other. They came out and they went back to the disciples to disclose that they also were witnesses of the fact that the tomb was empty. In Luke chapter 24, beginning around verse number 13, we read of another account. Now, now this is what Luke was telling when he wrote, by many infallible proofs. In Luke, excuse me, in in uh, Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, there were two disciples. They were not apostles. They were disciples of the Lord that were on their way, on the road to Emmaus. While they were talking of the current events of what had taken place in the last few hours, the death of Jesus Christ, the, the burial of the Lord, and, and uh, all, while they were discussing all these things, uh, there appeared unto them also a stranger, a third individual, a, a man walking alone that joined himself with them on the road to Emmaus. And they began to discuss uh, the current events. Have you not heard what's been going on in Jerusalem? them lately and then uh, uh, this third individual this third one began to describe to them and give them understanding of what Moses had said what the prophets had said about the, the, the Messiah about Jesus Christ and uh, the Bible said that he opened their understanding finally as the day grow long and, and they were arriving close to the destination they decided to uh, uh, the third member said I, I must leave you now I'm going to go on my way and they prevailed upon him saying no stay they enjoyed his company they prevailed on him to sit and have dinner with them and when he sat there to dinner and began to break the bread the Bible says that their eyes were open and they beheld and realized that they were talking to Jesus all the while and immediately the Lord Jesus disappeared from their midst these two disciples jumped to their feet and the scripture tells us that they ran back to Jerusalem and told the apostles, the 12 or 11 apostles, the things that they had witnessed. In John, many infallible proofs. In John chapter 20, we find that the, the, the uh, 10 uh, apostles minus uh, Thomas were there in that room, uh, upper room, or that abode where Peter and John and the rest were, were together. And, and uh, while they were there, the doors were closed, the windows were closed, and, and they were uh, uh, in fellowship one another. Who knows what they're speaking about? But all of a sudden, the scripture says, before their midst, the Lord Jesus appeared and said, Peace be unto you, it is I have risen in 
being revealed himself to the ten that was there. And they believed. They touched. They saw the wounds. They saw the scars. But, but however, Thomas had not been there when Jesus revealed himself for the first time in the, that upper room. And so when the news reached Thomas, and Thomas says, I will not believe until I've touched the prints on his, uh, the nail prints in his hands. And I thrust in my hand into the scar of his side. And so eight days later, the Bible tells us in John chapter 20, verse 26, that again the Lord Jesus presented himself. And this time before the 11 apostles, Thomas being there, and Jesus addressed Thomas directly and said, Believe and doubt not. Thrust your hand to my side. Reach out your hand, your finger, and touch the scars in my hand. And we find the profession that Thomas had. My Lord and my God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6, Paul writes about the things of discussion here. The, the resurrected Savior the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. And Paul makes this statement while, uh, while sending a letter, penning a letter to the church in Corinth, and he says that, that Jesus was seen during his, after his passion at one time by over 500 people. That at one time after his death, burial, resurrection, before his ascension, 500 congregated individuals witnessed the risen Savior. And then Paul goes on to say, and I also, an apostle born out of season, in other words, he's a little bit younger than the rest of the apostles. He says, an apostle born out of season saw him also, saw him too. Now, whether he is referring to his road where the light, the light came and and cast him to his feet, or when he later, when he uh, another place said that he was risen to, I think it was a third heaven. What or when or how the circumstances he does not disclose. But Paul said, "I saw him too." You see, what I'm trying to get across this evening is that there is no question, there is no doubt. That what we are talking about is not a fairy tale, it is not a story, it is not elaborated or a hyperbole. But what we are talking about is that Jesus came out of a borrowed tomb. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, there on the Mount of Olives, Jesus commanded them to stay in Jerusalem. He told them that they should receive power, that they would receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon them. And then the scripture says that he was received out of their sight. Every one of these examples that I've shared with you are witnesses to the fact that Jesus is alive. The Mount of Olives when he ascended into heaven. Paul's out of season saw him. 500 saw him at another time. The, the, on John chapter 20, the 11 saw him with the company of Thomas. The 10 saw him in John chapter 20 without the company of, of Thomas. In Luke 24, uh, two, straight, two disciples saw him on the road to Emmaus. In John chapter 20, uh, uh, they, they ran and saw, Peter and John ran and saw an empty tomb. And, uh, and, and on and on we see the, the soldiers that ran back to the high priest witnessed the fact that he was a risen Savior. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, perhaps Joanna as well as others, ladies, witnessed the fact that the tomb was empty and that Jesus is alive. I know that you're looking at me and saying, Brother Smith, what are you trying to get across? I'm, I'm not trying to blow your mind with some kind of scriptural or, or, or doctrinal revelation. I'm just trying to help us to realize 
and to not just know it here, but to get it down inside of here that Jesus is alive. He is alive. Jesus is alive. God is still working through, if you will, the persons of Christ Jesus. Praise God. Four women, 11 disciples, 12 disciples actually, including Thomas and the one that was later elected. Two on the road to Emmaus, 500 at one time. And Paul out of season. All have said and given us the infallible proofs that Luke wrote about that he came out of his borrowed tomb. Praise God. But I want to clarify something here tonight. I want to bring a point out of all of this. Direct your attention, if I can, back to Scripture for just a few more minutes, and I'm not going to be long now. We're in verse number 2 of Acts chapter 1. The Bible says that until the day he was taken up. It didn't say he was taken out. It didn't say he was taken away. Can I preach on this just a little bit? The scripture said he was taken up. It didn't say he was taken out of the world. It didn't say that he was taken away from the world or his creation. It just says that in bodily form he was taken up out of their vision. Praise God. I'll never forget it. I, I can't remember all the st- details right now, but I'll never forget. There are times of revelation of life. There are times that God just, just and brings enlightenment and revelation to your mind and your spirit. You know what I'm talking about? I'll never forget one time. It was, it's, it's been many, many years ago now, but, 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 but this revelation came to me. And that was this. We talk about the death. We talk about the life. We talk about the the crucifixion. We talk about the death. We talk about the burial. We talk about the resurrection. We talk about the ascension of Jesus. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can can capitalize on the passion but not realize that after the passion, he was only taken up. He was not taken away. He was not taken out. When I read about the, the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, what the revelation came to me was this. I may not be able to see him. Maybe I can't touch the nail prints in his hands or the scars in his side. But let me tell you something, honey. He's still here right now. He still operates in this world. He's still an ever-present help in trouble. He is my best friend. I can't say like Paul, I've seen him. But I'll tell you with all assurance and and conviction that I have felt him. I have heard him. I've, I've spoken to him. And my friend, he is alive and he's still here. Glory. To God. Verse 9 says, He was taken up in a cloud, and the cloud received him out of their sight. Now, the angels that were there speak with them said, He's going to come back in like fashion. But that like fashion speaks of His triumphant entry, if you will, in my persuasion, at the culmination of or if his redemption of Israel at the, at the time of great trouble of Israel after the battle of Armageddon, when he comes back and he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and splits that mountain in twain and brings victory to a nation that's about to eradicate and destroyed because God made a promise to Abraham, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make you a great nation. And God always keeps his promise. And so what I read right here is not a prophecy about to, that God is coming or Christ Jesus is coming in some futuristic time. He's here, but he's going to come in a physical manifestation on the Mount of Olives to come and bring victory to Israel at the great tribulation time of trouble. Jacob's trouble, if you will. The Battle of Armageddon. So don't get hung up 
about the body. Don't get hung up on what you see. Understand he's alive. And he is here. The body was removed. But yet Paul said, I saw him. He was taken up where? To a destination? No, but to a to the a place of where you and I can't see him. He wasn't taken up to some far reaching astrological planet somewhere out in the abyss. No, he was taken up out of their sight. But he's still here, and he is still operating. So even yet today, we need to understand, and if I could only but build your faith to help you know that he's alive and he's still here. I don't know why I'm preaching this tonight. Perhaps it's because I received a phone call this week. A gentleman of the church, of whom I'll allow to be anonymous, called me up and said, Brother Smith, he said, I was working and as I worked, I looked out on the horizon, and I'm not going to give you all the details unless I disclose who it is. But he said, all of a sudden on the horizon, I saw a tall, athletic figure of a man clothed in brilliant light. He said, I stood there mesmerized while he walked. And the guy went on to explain some other things that he saw. And this is the statement that he summarized all that he revealed that he'd seen. He said, Jesus really is alive. Praise God. Brother Smith, do you believe that, that God may still reveals himself? Yes, sir, read Bob White. Do you believe in angels and spiritual beings? I've seen a few, I've known a few, and uh, I've dealt with a few demons and have been blessed to have the angel of the Lord to stand by me in the nighttime, if you will. Brother Smith, you're crazy in a Bessie bug. That's all right, but let me tell you, if he's not alive, then why am I standing here under the blessing of his umbrella? Why am I still alive tonight? Why does he still give me health? Why does he still give me a sound mind? Why has he continued to pour out blessings greater than I can contain? Because he's alive and I yet still see today that Jesus is alive by many infallible proofs. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You may be able to snooker me on a lot of things. You may be able to fool me on on matters of technological uh, intricacies and you might, might, might be able to, to stump me on mathematics and science but there's one thing my friend that you'll never be able to cut out of my recognition and my cognizance and that is that Jesus is alive praise God and so with that revelation tonight Jesus said this in John 14, 18. I will not leave you comfortless. You're not going to see me, but I'm going to come unto you. He's an ever-present help in trouble. And so I ask you, what do you have need of? What can Jesus do for you? Was it blind Bartimaeus that was called by the Lord Jesus to come over? I believe it was. When Bartimaeus approached, Jesus looked at him and said, What do you want? Wasn't it blind Bartimaeus that looked at the Lord Jesus and said, Oh, that I might receive my sight. The Bible tells us that it gives, that it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. 
Let me help you understand what that means. When the prodigal son left the house of his father, he walked away, spent all that he had in debauchery and sinful affairs. When he came back to his father, he came back with a, a beggar's mentality just to be a servant in his father's home. But look what his dad did. His dad put new shoes on his feet. The dad put new clothes on his back. The dad had a party in his honor. And furthermore, the dad put the family insignia ring that gave him the authority to operate as an operative and to purchase, to buy and sell of the family's inheritance and nest egg. And he was given, if you will, a place of sonship with full authority and full dominion over the house of his father and the affairs of his father's uh, a farm if you will and when I look at that then I look back at scripture that says that it is the father's good pleasure to give us the, the kingdom then I understand though I was lost yet now I'm found though I wasted my life in sin and debauchery yet the grace of God has come to me and he's put shoes on my feet he's robed me in a robe of righteousness he's killed the fatted calf of celebration and my return to his kingdom. And furthermore, he's given me the power to operate as a child of God, to bind and he'll bind it in heaven or to loose and he'll loose it in heaven. I'm trying to get across tonight that Jesus is alive and the power in that revelation is able to move in any affair that you or I, or I might have. So what do you need? What do you need? You need your healing. He's alive. Healings did not stop when Jesus was taken up out of their sight. The death did not cease to be raised after Jesus passed from their sight. Because Peter went and raised, what was her name? Ta Tabitha or who was it that, that Peter raised? I can't remember now. Somebody tell me, come on Bible scholars. Dorcas. I said Tabitha. The death did not cease to be raised. Blessings did not stop when Jesus was taken out of their sight. Was it not a serpent that lashed on to, to, to uh, Paul's arm? Had no ill effect. Had no damage, no, 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 no harm at all. Blessings did not cease to happen. And you know what? Even after Jesus passed from their sight, deliverance did not cease. Because I remember Peter being reserved to be hung. But the jail doors sprung open one night as the angel gave him passage out. Because Jesus is still alive. And if that's not enough to prove his existence, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the evidence of speaking other tongues, the joy unspeakable, that experience that is full of glory, is witness that he's still operating, he's still supplying our needs, and that he's still alive. I close tonight with John 14, 14. And I know I have not mesmerized or brought revelation that you don't know. But the scripture tells us, John 14, 14, Jesus speaking, says, if you love me, You'll keep my commandments. Now we know all the fact Jesus is alive. We know all the facts of what he will do for us. If we ask, we shall receive. When the fact that he is alive, it also leaves us with the responsibility to walk in holiness, to walk circumspectly, carefully, consciously, and to obey his law and his commandments. You know why I walk in holiness you know why I walk in obedience to the laws of God because Jesus is alive do you know why I have faith 
and a positive outlook for tomorrow, even though our economy looks grievous? Because Jesus is alive. Do you know why I can lift up my head after a life of, of foolishness? Because he said, neither do I condemn thee. Jesus is alive. You know the message of the church? Come on, babe. I'm done. You know what the message of the church is? It's a simple one. Jesus is alive. Praise God. I perhaps tonight could ask a few of you or many of you tonight to share some of your infallible proofs of how you know that Jesus is alive. First of all, we have the testimony of Scripture that is yea and amen and ever settled in heaven. But I can also tell you that in a prayer room in, in Jackson, Mississippi one time, I heard his voice speak to me. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you might suggest. I'll tell you one thing for certain. I know what I heard. I heard what I heard. And it breathed life into my heart. Jesus is alive. I can take you to a basement in Bethesda, Maryland. We're exhausted from work. Joined hand with the pastor and another gentleman, and we prayed. You don't have to believe me. It does not offend me if you don't. It really don't matter. I know what I know. I know what I felt. I felt the touch of the master's hand that changed me and transformed me. I've seen him give his angels charge over my key on the darkest days of my most recent life after I moved here to Savannah under extreme as only a parent can understand and only a child of God can comprehend extreme somehow that word doesn't give sufficiently describe it, but extraordinary pressure and duress. I packed up my children, my wife and daughters, went to Memphis on a Sunday and missed church on a Sunday. Something that I don't do. I'm, I'm, I'm religious about being the house of God, whether I'm preaching or not preaching on a Sunday. <laughs> Pulled up to the red light there in White Haven, the corner of Neely Road, Elvis Presley Boulevard, Highway 51. Sat in the turning lane. Car pulled out in front of a policeman doing about 50, 60, 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour on Elvis Presley Boulevard. That car that he hit careened, and I saw it slide towards my automobile on two wheels on its side, slide towards my automobile. the angels of the Lord stand there and say this is far enough stop the car within 18 inches of my bumper and then move that automobile beside me it never touched my vehicle I was the first one at the red light it rolled and bumped into the guy in the adjacent lane behind me I'm hungry. He feeds me. When I'm weak, He restores my soul. When I am perplexed, if I just wait on Him, He'll bring the light of His gospel word to give me direction. He's more than my best friend. 
I'm proud to be known Christian. I pray by the grace of God that I can in my life bring honor to Him. That's what I'm looking for. Would you stand with me tonight? Many infallible proofs. Many infallible proofs. You know them. I have more to share. I won't. I wonder tonight if we can just recognize His visitation. Say, Lord, I love you.